If it bleeds, it leads. That's common wisdom in the news industry. It hasn't always been the case. And here in the Czech Republic, we've seen post-revolution Prague change and shift its priorities as far as news through the 90s and up to the present day. Now, I'm sure people are tired of hearing me talk about how long I have been here, but today I'm with somebody who's been here even longer. He came in 1990. I'm here with Douglas Lytle, currently an editor for Bloomberg in London. He used to be the uh, head of breaking news in London. He's written for the Wall Street Journal. He wrote a book about Prague, and he's basically just a news and writing guy who occasionally makes forays to Prague to check out the scene. Hi, Douglas. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming, and thank you everybody for listening to this episode of Prague Times. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. So, Doug, as I said at the top, you came here in 1990, is that right? Yes, August of 1990. Why? Well, that's a good question. I uh, actually had nothing in my past that would drag me to the Czech Republic, or at that time it was just known as Czechoslovakia, of course. But I met a woman in uh, San Francisco where I was working at the Oakland Tribune then, uh, who was working at the paper there too, and she was Czech, and she and her sister had uh, decided to come back and teach English. I decided to go with her, and that's how I eventually wound up here in August of 1990. So you were already doing new stuff, so obviously when you got here, you were looking around, hey, what can I do? Exactly. The whole goal was to get overseas and do the international uh, reporting thing. It had always been a goal of mine, even going back to college, because I had briefly done a, a major in Russian at USC in Los Angeles, but I dropped it when I was because I was so lazy that I couldn't actually put in the time to actually do it properly. At that time, my interest was very Slavophile, and want, I wanted to go to Moscow or something like that at that time. Pretty soon after you got here, you were one of the people who helped uh, start what was in the 90s the English language newspaper here, Prague Post. Yes, I arrived in August, and for the first year, I taught uh, English at the Zakladny Shkola in Lupachova, which is in Zhishkov. And uh, I taught sports to kids and and uh, English, and uh, made a mockery of teaching. I, how the hell that they ever gave me the opportunity to actually teach? They were giving jobs to anybody who could speak English. Exactly, <laughs> and we lived we lived on the outskirts of Prague in Dumuchitelu. And uh, it was sort of like going back to college because it was like a college dorm with all the teachers who were assembled to teach English in that first wave of people who came after the revolution. So uh, I was doing that, and uh, then Prognosis appeared. That was the first English language publication after the revolution. And I think I did one or two articles for them, and I had friends who obviously did many more. And it became like the main publication at that time, and I think this was in 91, 92, I don't remember exactly when, but I went home for the summer in 91, and when I came back in August to start my second year of teaching, my friend, who was also a journalist who had come with me, he had told me that uh, they were going to start a paper, and it was going to be led by Alan Levy. And we all knew Alan Levy because he had written the book about the invasion of Czechoslovakia back in 1968, and at the time it was called Rowboat to Prague, but he retitled it as So Many Heroes. And because there were certain books that you, everybody read when they arrived in the Czech Republic, yeah, Czechoslovakia, yeah, yeah. Rowboat to Prague was one of them there were a few others that everybody had somehow found and this was well before there were reading lists and things like that I don't and, know if how you, and if you hadn't read these books then something was wrong with you exactly <laughs> yeah. and so the name Alan Levy was known so that's uh, I went over there I remember I think it was on a Sunday afternoon to the offices that they had rented just off of Old Town Square and uh there he was, and that was the initial initial group of people, and I got on board, and uh, mm -hmm. it was good because the ambitions of the paper at the time were to do very, very hard-hitting journalism, and mm -hmm. that's sort of what we wanted to do. And then it became like, not only that, but sort of just like a, a way of life for everybody. We had so many friends through it, and, sure. and, and I stayed with it until about 1994. 
So that kind of got your sea legs. And then what did you do after that? Uh, during the time that we were doing the early days of the paper, it was growing exponentially because there was no normal publication for, in English for uh, expatriates and especially people outside of the country who wanted to know what was going on. Obviously, the development of journalism, there was no internet yet and there mm. was no uh, social media. And so people really relied on the Prague Post as a daily or a weekly bit of information. Libraries in the United States, we remember the subscriptions were coming from all over the United States for libraries and people who wanted uh, law offices. The, the lawyers would read it. Eric Best was doing his morning translations of the newspapers, uh, the fleet sheet, but this was more of a, a weekly thing. And then we started the one key thing, and I'm still very proud of this day. I, I'm the one who started the uh, night and day with some other people. Night and day was an easy thing because we basically modeled it on the Village Voice. So, so people know night and day was a listing of, hey, here's what's happening in Prague or near Prague uh, for the coming weekend or for the coming week. And those of us who lived here, like, that was our Bible. We deliberately made it a, a pullout and a way that you could t take it with you at the time. And it had all the right listings and it required a tremendous amount of just actual walking around to check things because you couldn't pick up a phone and call these places. Obviously, a lot of people didn't speak Czech. Mm -hmm. So it required tremendous amount of going to places, making sure that the times of the movies were right because they weren't always correct and they were or they would change or they would change the last <laughs> yeah. minute exactly and so there was that was one of the fun parts of the things that it endured at the paper and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still very proud of that but during that time I also had met uh, some publishers in the United States in San Francisco at uh, North Atlantic Books and they were interested in my manuscript about the country and that became my major project between 93 and 94 mm -hmm. was to write a book about the first four years of the revolution in Czechoslovakia and along with uh, looking back at uh, the recent history of what had led the Czechs to that moment. If you look back at what was happening at the same time, there was not only that, but there was the split of the country. That was a major part of the news story that was here for those three years. It was not only there was privatization, but then there was the split of the country. Suddenly it's no longer Czechoslovakia, it's Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Exactly. The divorce, as they called it. One of the things with that period was that I was also trying to freelance but if you look at the development of media here during those years, everybody wanted to freelance. Everybody yeah. wanted a gig. Everybody wanted something. And it actually became very difficult to sell material to the United States for a variety of reasons. Either they already had it, they didn't care about it anymore, or you had been beaten out by somebody else. Also, because there was no email yet really on a regular basis, getting the material to them was very difficult. It would cost money to call up the publishers or call up people in the newspapers. I remember you used to go, they used to have these calling booths at the main post office and that's where often people would go for long distance phone calls exactly you'd waste maybe twenty dollars just trying to sell a story and yeah. i'm terrible at freelancing i'm not some of my friends here that was their main source of income and they did very well for themselves because they were somehow had the ability to make it happen i depended on having a job and a place to show up and right. a, a regular paycheck that's just me and then so you wrote the book and the title is pink tanks and velvet hangovers uh -huh. which uh, check the episode description for a little information and links if you're interested in checking out that book, which is still available. It's still available on Amazon, I believe. So I know Prog Post was trying to do what you might call real journalism. It wasn't just, hey, expats, here's a movie. Uh, what was that scene like? How receptive were the checks to these ideas? Were they already doing them? Were the journalists keen and eager? What was, what was it like? Well, it was a very interesting period because when I first moved in August of 1990, most people in the United States thought I was kind of crazy because... <laughs> because nobody had ever heard of Czechoslovakia, unless you were kind of a, a specialist in Eastern European studies. It wasn't a place that uh, a lot of people thought was going to take off. Nobody knew what was going to happen after the revolution because the whole concept of what was happening here was so unproven. There, nobody had ever seen anything like this before where you're taking 10 countries, if you include what happened in the former Soviet Union. If you take all the countries they were trying to transition to free market economies and also on top of that, open societies. ASAP. ASAP. Like super fast. Going one for the other. You know, I mean, it really was a difficult, unclear period of what was going to happen. And so so over the next few years, of course, it became known as the left bank of the 90s. Which I'm pretty sure was Alan Levy's it was definitely, term because he wanted the, that mm -hmm. kind of cachet. It was definitely Alan's term. I remember when he uh, read it out at the Prague Post press conference that we had to announce the debut of the paper. 
Um, and there were many people who came to that press conference from the Czech press who were skeptical about what we were trying to do. They said, do you really believe that there's going to be a market for an English language paper on a weekly basis covering politics, covering the economy? Mm-hmm. And one of the big things about the, the owners of the Prague Post at that time is that they did identify clearly that the stories were, okay, you had Havel, of course, Václav Havel, who's the, the major story and the reason that put Czechoslovakia on the map after the revolution. But beyond that, the stories were, who is going to come in and buy the companies here? Mm. Who is going to become successful? What happens to privatization? There was a whole series of things that were not necessarily about culture. They were not about an open society. They were about the physical manifestation of capitalism here. That became a draw for a lot of a lot of news organizations here. And it's the development of the international media Media here was such that there was Reuters, there was AP, and there were a few other news organizations that had uh, pitched in. A lot of stringers, and The Guardian had a stringer, and The Times of London had a stringer, and The Independent had a stringer. And for a long time, there was a very robust uh, a foreign press club, and that of course, was headed by Alan Levy, and uh, surprise. Yes, he was sort of the uh, he was sort of the mayor of all journalists here. I think. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and then. Then the Americans started to arrive, and they came, and they kept coming and arriving, and more plotted in, and it all seemed to feed on itself. All of these people looking for the left bank of the 90s, and I'm, I do not believe that you can undersell that statement after all these years, because it sort of fed on itself. So by coming here and everybody saying I was crazy, and then three years later, everybody following me here, we all looked like prophets or something strange. Trailblazer. I, I, trailblazers, exactly. <laughs> So we, uh, by 93, 94, the scene was fully established and Prognosis was still going, doing their thing. And all of a sudden there was sort of like a zeitgeist here of, of the foreign Western people, British people, f- French people, um, and all the Americans. And so you started to get all the restaurants and then there was Obetsny Doom and all the different nightlife places. And some people came here to try to make money, and some of them came here just to hang out and have a good time. Mm. Some of them stayed for a long time, like me, and others... Not so long. Others just did six months and went home. Yeah. It was almost like a a middle-class grand tour. (laughs) (laughs) I've not thought in those terms, but that's very true. (laughs) That that is very true. Because you'd always have people go here, and then they would go to Budapest, and then they would go, actually, I think I like Prague more, and... Well, it is funny because, you know, one of the owners of the Prague Post tried to establish a newspaper in uh, Budapest, and it was called the Budapest Post. Mm. And in the end, it didn't work, partly because the the markets were really very different. They never had the cachet that Prague did, and for some reason, Prague made it when other cities didn't. And we we, we really laughed at the time when the book Prague came out. The no, It's a novel, which was, when it first came out, we all thought, oh, here's the book that came out of the left bank of the 90s. And the action actually doesn't take place in Prague at all. No, because Prague is used as a mythical city on the hill that they want to get to, but they're stuck in Budapest. Which, yeah. And that kind of tells you a lot about the differences in the way they regarded their time in the two cities. So mm-hmm. there was a tremendous amount of interest in uh, the country for about three years, especially as with Havel and the split of uh, Czechoslovakia, that made sure that, that the country was in the headlines quite a bit and it made it easier for me to sell my book in around uh, 1995 when it came out because there was still a lot of interest in what had happened here after the revolution Mm. but then I do feel like it sort of fell off a cliff at that point and it never was the same the coverage of the country has never been the same because it just isn't there's not been a news cycle here that can drive it The marketplace changed for the kind of material that people were seeking out of the the Czech Republic and Slovakia at that time. There wasn't a lot of business news. It's hard to describe to the the wider world. There have been many questions about why the Czech Republic developed the way it did. It became a successful economy that prospered with the help of a tremendous amount of foreign investment, especially in the car and the automobile industry. But in terms of the actual media cycle itself, there just wasn't a lot of interest anymore in what these countries were doing. It was sort of like, well, that was then, and they moved on first to the Bosnian War, and then after the Bosnian War, 
Then the story shifted to South Africa, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a lot of places where people were, maybe there was something more tactile going on. And the Czech Republic became sort of just a predictable place of investment. But nobody was interested in Havel anymore. That had been done. Mm -hmm. um, nobody was interested in the, the small minutia of politics here, which were pretty gray. But the Czechs uh, very much are. Czechs will sit around in a pub and talk about, this guy said this in Parliament, this guy said this. Well, you know, he voted like this 15 years ago. They talk about this stuff the way that many Americans I know talk about baseball. Like, it's a, it's a hobby, but that didn't seem to attract a wider audience. It's not Germany. Yeah. It's not Germany. It doesn't... The Czechs occasionally have moments where something important happens. Um, Nagano, of course, was a major story. Not only, obviously, here. It was the, one of the biggest events I've ever seen or covered in the Czech Republic, but... Nagano as a as as a sort of an international story was huge and it did bring some reporters here for a while. We saw a lot of international interest on the left bank of the nineties and it seemed like every other week somebody from CBS or NBC came through town interviewing people at the various stations of the cross, which would be like the poetry place. You you, you what's Beef Stew. Beef Stew. It was at the Club Radost and it was uh, every Sunday would-be writers and aspiring writers would get together and read their stuff out loud. And there was um, other important places. The Globe opened, which was the first English-language bookstore of note, and it was modeled, of course, after a coffee house in the United States, so that it had a very familiar feeling when you walked in. You felt like you were sort of home anywhere in America. Mm -hmm. And it was a big success, not only for the English-language speaking crowd, but I think that a lot of Czechs who wanted to learn English or were fascinated by the West would come in, and they were able to attract uh, writers there like Richard Ford or uh, Allen Ginsberg and th that was a big sort of a step forward for the left bank of the 90s and of course it fit perfectly in with the narrative right so you had CNN coming there and doing interviews and and but there's only so much you can run with that and I do think that somewhere around probably around 96 or 97 this it started to peter out in terms of not only the interest of covering a story like that but I don't know if they really were that is that's when people started to the scene started to kind of even even out a little a bit. lot of people left and about that time we were back in uh, New York because I had taken a job with Dow Jones see you left so. I left <laughs> yeah. I left I had never intended to stay here forever that was the thing I the funny thing about the whole thing is that it seems to I seem to keep coming back and mm -hmm. I married a Czech in 1996 and we had a daughter in New York and then I was transferred back to Prague in 1997 by Dow Jones to run the operations here um, and at that time we were in a shared offices with the Associated Press mm. and um, I spent between 1997 and 2003 uh, covering the country and the region. And how had, so you left for a short while and then you come back, had it changed? Had the, had the news system changed, the priorities? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think I remember being very disappointed when I came back because the same politicians were still fighting over the same things. <laughs> and it was very stuck between two different camps. There was H Havel's camp and at that time Václav Klaus. Yes. And the two sides were very uh, polarized and the country was a bit polarized because of that. And then Klaus did not do nearly as well in the 1997 elections and they had the thing which was known as the Opposition Smlova, which was the opposition agreement here. It was basically a power sharing agreement. But the period between 97 and about 2000 was notable for the, the really big privatizations of the banking world, which was particularly um, good and bad in that finally the banks were cleaned up because they had been egregiously tunneled by, by checks and some foreigners. But the asset stripping here in the early 90s was profound. Yeah, and, and it wasn't it wasn't like what happened in the former Soviet Union, but it wasn't not like that. No, it was a it's an echo of what 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 you've seen happen under Yeltsin's period in power. Uh, the asset stripping and the the sheer waste of a lot of physical assets that could have actually been useful in mm. some way or another if they had been properly privatized instead of just people losing their money. And it soured people a lot on the process, which was regrettable, I think. Mm -hmm. It could have been with a little more care or something, I don't, uh, probably a better moral compass, they would have probably had a better, a better transition period because it was, it was very, very ugly for about three, four years. I mean, it's a bit of a cultural stereotype, but, you know, Czechs kind of have this, well, of course they're corrupt. <laughs> 
you know, attitude. Like, of course, because they're empowered. That's what people do when they get empowered. They're, they're corrupt and they steal what they can. Isn't that the normal way of things? And it just kind of reinforces that, that cultural cynicism. Cynicism is obviously a major part of the Czech psyche, and it's both frustrating and wonderful at the same time to live in a country like that. My whole development in terms of understanding the Czech Republic and in a lot of ways coming to terms with my own life here has been always a series of reevaluations about how I feel about the Czech Republic or how I am regarded in the Czech Republic or how I live in the Czech Republic as an American. And I'll be the first to admit that over the years I have made hundreds of misinformed statements about this country or the people. I've uh-huh. gotten things wrong. I don't mean in my reporting. That's not what I'm talking about. But in terms of the way I feel about things or the way I perceive the Czechs to be and how I feel that they have treated me or... Um, what their motivations are, why they say things like exactly. that or why they have these attitudes. Uh, and nine times out of ten, I was wrong. Uh-huh. about my, my, my initial impression about something was wrong. Or the things that I didn't like when I first arrived here, regardless of what they might be, it could be anything from food to uh, to cultural stereotypes, I grew to embrace and love over the years. Mm-hmm. And the things that I like doing now are extremely Czech. Uh, the, the concept of klid a pohoda, which is known in, in English as calm and... Um, and pohoda, which is untranslatable, but it basically means like a kind of a chilled out good time with no stress. Exactly. And to embrace that and to understand why the idea of having a, a chata or a weekend cottage is so important to the Czech lifestyle, the Czech mentality, the Czech philosophy. These things over the years, is they've been, I've sort of rubbed these edges away to understand that it wasn't them, it was me over the years that needed to grow up and learn these things and mm. to make less bald-faced assertions about things I didn't really understand. Mm-hmm. Because they're not necessarily communist, they're not rooted in the communist era, things that happened to them in the communist, they could be even going back further. Oh, yeah. The traditions that were uh, before the, in the First Republic or even under the Austrian-Hungarian empire yeah i mean I'm, i often will tell people when americans or other foreigners say well you know it's because of communism i'll say really read kafka because that's before communism and he's making fun of the same bureaucratic mindset that is clearly the austro-hungarian empire and that goes all the way back to 1620 400 years ago this year was the battle of white mountain Exactly. And I, that you, it's funny you mentioned the Battle of the White Mountain because it came up in a conversation uh, we had at a family reunion over the weekend and, uh, where one of the relatives said that he believed the whole fundamental Czech psyche can be traced to the Battle of White Mountain. It's, a, it's, an odd, it's an odd way to look at things because it's so many hundreds of years ago that you have to ask yourself, really? Is that the whole reason that the country is the way it is? Let it go, guys. <laughs> Let it go. It was 400 years ago. Let it go. Uh, and the idea that they still can't take anything for granted because they always know that it's going to be taken away from them at the last minute or that they are going to lose this small country. That, that The conversation that we had at this reunion was interesting because it started with that and it inevitably went into the idea of that it's the small nation mentality and we're just mm. a, Klaus himself, the prime minister and then later president, said over the years, anytime he got attacked for one of his beliefs, he said, well, we're just a small nation. What do we know? You need to teach us about these things. Which <laughs> totally insincerely. <laughs> of course, of course. And he said, we didn't know these things. We're just a small nation, to which a lot of my relatives hate this because they've traveled all over the world. They worked for Doctors Without Borders or other done great things around the world. And they, they said they, I, they do not want to see their country be belittled mm. as a small nation of pathetic, weak people. Because they're not. They're no. clearly not. I mean, the the fact that they didn't fight, per se, when the Battle of the White Mountain happened and the Hopsburgs basically said, okay, this is now 100% completely ours and you'll do what we say. When I think about Czech attitudes towards things like this, I'm often reminded of a line at the end of the movie Full Metal Jacket, which is that the dead only know one thing, it is better to be alive. And I think Czechs kind of pick their battles. They don't want to die for some abstract idea and not make a difference. They'd rather live and deal with the nonsense rather than die for, uh, you know, in a blaze of glory for some abstract cause. It does seem that they, there's an element of um, reticence to engage with the wider world among a lot of people because they're afraid that they may not measure up. I think a lot of terms about what they say in the South sometimes, which is don't get above your raisin. Uh-huh. And that seems to 
be sometimes uh, I see this in people here who, well, I don't know much about that because that's not in my business. Or I, I wouldn't go to England and live for two years because, well, I wouldn't be here then. And yeah. if you do see this, we live in London now, and it, to meet Czechs there is, is actually a rare event. There are not many of them there. Mm. There, are, there are, of course, but not like the Poles and not like Bulgarians and Romanians who have come to England seeking better life or uh, better jobs. Mm. But you rarely see Czechs doing jobs there. It just doesn't happen that much. And th that doesn't mean they're not traveling, but it doesn't mean that they're going there to work and to, right. to assimilate into another culture or spend a few years learning something different and coming home. And yet this small country mentality, as you say, when Czechs do go abroad and live abroad, they often accomplish astonishing things. Uh, I'm going to do a whole episode on my somewhat half-joking theory that the Czechs secretly rule the world, but it's such a big secret that they themselves are not aware of this. Well, of course, there's the writer, the, 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 the whole theater that's based around that was Zimmerman and the mythical character. And I'm, I'm really poorly informed on the whole thing because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a level of Czech that I never accomplished to be able to really understand it in Czech. And I've read it in English and I've seen some of the, the plays in Czech. Uh, but they're, they're immensely complicated for me. And the main thrust of it is that the Zimmerman guy is always inventing something or doing something right before everybody else, but they nobody bothers to notice so for example right. they got to the North Pole first but nobody noticed that or he invented electricity but again nobody noticed that yeah. or the and telephone the, I think isn't there isn't there there a may be I'm, I'm a, he he's gonna go in and register the international patent for the telephone but then like they're not there he's like well I'm kind of hungry I could have lunch and he goes away and Alexander Graham Bell beats him beats him to the uh, registration office you know. Exactly, exactly. So yes, there's that. Um, that's not to say that the Czechs haven't been very influenced by the West. It's been the, the overriding story since 1990. If you just look at what Prague and, and the environment around Prague has become, it is so international and so cosmopolitan now in a way that I could never have dreamed when I first arrived here in 1990. No one would have predicted that this city would embrace internationalism and cosmopolitanism the way that it has. And I think a lot of it is this young generation, these millennials and now Gen Zers who they're kind of, they're still really like into being Czech. There's what I call UNOS syndrome. That's like, well, this is how we do it. And this is how we do bread. And this is how our goulash looks. And we like it that way. But they've been traveling for so long. They've had access via the internet and other things to world culture. And in many ways, they're Europeans first check second. That's very true of what Prague has become. And it's important to note that Prague is really unto itself in, I think, in the country at large, because if you travel around the rest of the country, the things that we're seeing in Prague, the kind of restaurants, the kind of bars, the kind of nightlife, the kind of cultural activities that are available, that hasn't necessarily filtered out into the smaller cities. There, it, there are echoes of it out there, but it's a lot harder out there. And of course, you see this in the politics where by the president is not liked at all in Prague because he they is... they love him in the borderlands. And they love him in, in the hinterlands, that's for sure. <laughs> Just coming up this uh, late summer, early autumn in Prague, provided, of course, COVID allows us to uh, to have these things actually occur. Like, there's a Mexican film festival in a couple of weeks from this recording. Modern Mexican films. We have an annual Iranian film festival. We have, like, all this stuff that there's no way. This stuff didn't exist 20 years ago. No chance. There was no chance chance that you would even have enough people interested to have a Mexican film festival. If you'd had one in the 1990s, it would have failed. There's a Mexican market in the center of Prague, and it's better than anything in London. Really? It has distribution that's wider. They actually, I think, send stuff to London because they don't have the things that in London that they can get from here. Nobody would have dreamed of things like this. And the quality of some of the presentation, the food, uh, it's odd that we keep going back to the food, but if you keep in mind that when we came here in 1990 as foreigners, it was a really dreary experience. It was Czech food, and that was it, and shut your face and eat it. And it wasn't always very good Czech food. But even little things like coffee was, was treated with contempt. It was just one kind of coffee with the grounds in it. And now, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of cafes here. Now, I'm not marking everything we do here by that, but it does show you the kind of development on a lot of things. Everything that we took for granted in the West wasn't here when we first arrived.
And there's a tremendous also, the younger generation is, is developing a good sense of green values, which I think are going to be very, very important in any city. Do you know Czechs recycle more per capita than anyone else in the EU? I did not know that. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. And that all came as a result of, it had to be something other than the government because the government didn't steer Czechs towards any of that kind of success in thinking. Yeah, I think I think that's very true. I think uh, and in Prague, what we see is a lot of citizen level, grassroots, even urban planning discussions to the point where other cities are starting to send people here to see, hey, how are you guys doing this? And yes, what it means is that when some developer has some new plan, hey, we're going to this island that nobody's using, we want to turn it into this. And then the citizen activist groups get in there and go, whoa, hey, hold on a second. You're just trying to turn this into a commercial zone. That's crap. How about creating some public spaces? And they'll they'll actually get the project altered to make Prague a better place for everybody. And when all said and done, it's kind of win-win because the developers are still making their money. Plenty of commercial space still there. But now there's also a park and schools and we're gonna have bike pads, and we're gonna have this, and by the way, what about the ducks? And they need a little place for them. And so the city is developing in such a way that over the next 30, 40 years, it's going to become, I think, one of the premier cities in Europe. Well, you can certainly see this in the pricing because prices here in Prague, that was the other thing that I never thought I would see, that, <laughs> that beer would become a growing expensive commodity here. It's not what it once was when it was 25 cents a glass or whatever it was at the... Or it, less. 10 cents a glass <laughs> yeah. in the early years. It's become increasingly expensive to the point that I'm. it's shocking sometimes that it doesn't mean that people are limiting what they're drinking, but it does necessarily mean that people can't have... You can't go cruising around Prague and eat in every restaurant anymore or have a Western lifestyle on a moderate salary. You need a good salary now. A lot I mean, of, keep in mind, a beer is still three bucks. Exactly. Maybe four it's bucks. It's not like in London where it can be six to seven pounds. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not even close to those prices. But the wages, one of the problems there is that the wages, if you're not making Western wages, eh, it's, it's, it gets harder and harder, I think. That's very true because in the early, that's one of the things I think that fueled the American left bank of the 90 drive is that people could park up here for six months on savings that weren't that prodigious, blow through them and go home. But you cannot rock up here anymore unless you have serious job, serious intent. And most importantly, and I think this is a real credit to the Czechs, they don't need that advice anymore. They yeah. don't need some person who says, I can speak English, so I ergo need a job and do it better than you. That's not true because half the kids I've talked to have a grasp of English that's on a par with like young kids in Sweden yeah. or in Germany or in Denmark or in Holland. These are kids that have come up they don't even have accents in some cases. Yeah. They speak English that it's well. It's eerie. You go, hey, where in the States did you live? Nowhere. Oh, because that's a Southern California accent, pal. Thing. So you were here till, the, uh, what, 2003, you said? We left. No, I, we came back in 1997, and we stayed, uh, and I stayed until uh, 2012. 2012. So you were right up through the, all of that, that period. You saw the city start to slowly start to change. The, its biggest changes have been since then. That's very true. And it was funny because that I received citizenship in 2012. Mm. And, and then you left. And then I left. <laughs> and then things really started to change. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, you know, we're talking uh, a lot of surface stuff, like what it's like on the ground to live here. Hey, there's Mexican food. Hey, there's Indonesian food. Hey, I can get, you know, electronics delivered to my house the same day I order them online. Very much a, not just a modern Western style existence, but in some ways even more progressive than, say, what you might find in the United States. And yet, I feel like that's on that level, but when you get to the governmental level, to the press, and things like this, like the Czech Republic first got on the Reporters Without Borders ranking list back in 2013, and they ranked 16th freest press out of 180 countries. And then they bumped up to 13th for a couple of years, and now we've watched it start to slide, and this year we're at number 40, which out of 180 is still not terrible. One of the main criticisms of that watchdog organization is that uh, there are fewer and fewer journalists willing to be critical of what has become just kind of, as, as our friend Mark Baker would say, the same old jokers pulling the same old tricks and arguing over the same old stuff and stealing the same assets and money over and over and over again. 
That's very true. And a lot of what's happened here with the media is, is very much part and parcel of what's happened in, in many other countries. It's not unique. It's just a reflection of where media is at this time in, in general. Mm. But part of the problem here is that there's, it's a smaller pond, so there's fewer jobs in the industry and there are fewer places to work. And when those particular places were taken over by various oligarchs, usually of Czech Czech background or Slovak background, that is where the real problem has started in terms of the freedom of the press. Because once, say for example, the prime minister owns Mlada Franta and the Mlada Franta uh, publishing group, as he does, you know that you're not going to get a lot of material that is uh, directly critical of him or his policies or of the various investigations against him on... on let's, let's change that to numerous investigations. Numerous. Yeah. So there's, that's one. That's just one. Now, in a few months, uh, Tomasz Kellner is going to own TV Nova outright, and he's the richest man in the Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. And he is going to have tremendous access to the most widely listened to news program every day. Yeah, in the country. Yeah. In the country. Yeah. Now... They do still have a lot of interesting writers. They still have a lot of uh, interesting perspectives, but they are limited more and more to certain publications that um, are independent, Mm -hmm. but they're not widely read. They're not read. This is one of the reasons why you're having the problems, the polarization of this country between those in the in the hinterlands and in here because they don't read that publication i'm speaking here right. of respect mm-hmm. uh, they don't read respect and that's the only one that really comes at it from what i would be probably known to some as the havelian perspective even though that over the years has changed as well mm. but those that carry the flag for a free press it is tough here and the other problem is that if you are a journalist and there's only so many jobs to available and they tell you you have to be a certain way people tend to bend the knee and Yes. And go with it. I, 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 I've got to pay for my hata. <laughs> exactly. It's a job, it's a job, it's a job. Yeah. So. This country has been amazingly lucky, I think, over the years to have nothing really go that wrong. There, yeah. have been, there have been some bad events. There were the floods. There were, there's been, obviously, uh, some natural disasters. Uh, the government has gotten things wrong from time to time, so there's been a couple recessions. But nobody has gone hungry. The shops are full. People have uh, proceeded in their lives. They, Crime continues to go down. It's not a dangerous country. It never has been. And uh, for all of the things that have happened over the years that perhaps maybe we lived through, so they irked us a lot, <laughs> like privatization or watching things get go haywire with the government and and sort of what I would also think is the the sort of ruining of Václav Havel's name for many years at the hands of people like Václav Klaus and his sort of supporters. Those things over the long run as they get farther out and you telescope back through history, they've been very, very lucky and they they need to remember that. And Mm -hmm. so for a young journalist to come here now is pointless unless they want to do research on some particularly weird, if they're a historian or something like that. There's many, many stories here yet to be told. One of the things that has always, I've always felt that has just not been told properly yet is communism and what they did to themselves here over the years willingly. And this was, unfortunately, you know, the Mandela, the Mandela board that they created in South Africa the, for reconciliation, it would have been maybe a good thing here, but nobody, yeah. they didn't have it at the time. And there's never been a proper, I believe... Like a reckoning. A reckoning with the past. And if you look at even the films that they've made about that period over the years, there are very few that actually are like the deer hunter or in your face about yeah. really getting down to what happened here in a critical way. There are a few films and there's some literature about it, but I don't believe that they've ever really done it. The closest that I've seen was uh, Burning Bush, which Bush was made ironically by a Pole, which is Agnieszka <laughs> Holanda. Right. And she made that film uh, for HBO a few years ago, a three-part series. That's the closest I've seen them do a real raw look at unflinching about that period. Because uh, it was. No, it wasn't death camps deep in the jungle and things like this but it was it was also not just somewhat uncomfortable like people died people lost their livelihoods people suffered physically mentally emotionally professionally like this was not it was not a good time there have been a few films like Pelishki and Pupendo but there's a tremendous amount of humor in those movies which 
I think, blunts the trauma of mm. what actually happened here. However, humor is also a good device, and it, is, it makes, the, makes the film more entertaining. And Czech irony and humor has always been world class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For those that can appreciate or read it in Czech or understand the, the, the irony and the humor, those things are fine. The Bubble Revolution happened 31 years ago this year, and the country certainly has managed to achieve many of its goals and make many of the transitions that it was striving for in the 90s, I think. And it's become a pretty solid place. What does the future hold for this country? I think a lot of that's in the hands of the younger generations. I think they're the ones who are pointing the way forward, and they're the ones who are becoming, in many ways, pan-Europeans which I'm all for it, personally. I don't, I don't really mind that. I, I like the Czech thing, but I also like the idea of the Czech Republic being very much integrated into Europe and maintaining the European humanist, liberal, democratic ideals. Frank Zappa, in his last appearance on a stage before he died, was here in Prague. Mm. And it was the night of the uh, final Soviet soldier leaving, and they had a big concert uh, at the arena here. And he, it was the last time he picked up a guitar on a stage. And he said, because there was the whole backstory. I don't know, um, you probably remember that Vat, Vatslav Havel asked Frank Zappa to become the U.S. ambassador for trade. Or so, I can't remember what title that See, Havel... I, I always heard that Zappa showed up here and volunteered himself to be minister of culture. It was something like that. And then <laughs> there was this talk that, the, that Zappa would help on trade or something to do with the United States government. And of course, that didn't go down well in Washington at the time. <laughs> And it never happened, but Zappa still played a, a large role here because that was one of the things that was so fascinating to me when I got here was to discover that a lot of the bands that I loved in the United States were somehow popular here. Mm -hmm. And it was a great part of my education to discover that the Velvet Underground and Iggy Pop and uh, bands like Zappa and the Mothers of Invention had become touchstones to a, a, that generation mm -hmm. and helped them not only endure, but it helped create a whole generation of new musicians because of that. Mm. And so when Zappa came here, it was he was treated like a royalty. And he said at the time, because uh, he was on stage, and I remember him saying, I hope that you can keep what it is that you love. I'm paraphrasing, of course, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I hope you can keep what you love here the most and don't let them change it. And what he meant by that was try to stay true to what makes you Czech or Slovak and try to endure through those things and keep the society that you hope it would be without losing your own Czechness or Slovakness because it was still Czechoslovakia then. Right. A wide-ranging conversation, to be sure, but uh, but a super interesting one. Thank you for talking to me today. Douglas Lytle. And don't forget, his book is called Pink Tanks and Velvet Hangovers. It is available on Amazon. Check the episode description for a link. Uh, thanks for talking to me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times. <laughs>